Hello and welcome to this tutorial on forming images with ultrasound. Before we begin, it's useful to note that the concepts of ultrasonic imaging are very easy to understand, but the design and manufacture of hardware needed to implement those concepts can be considerably more complex. We'll start by considering the reflection and transmission phenomena that occur at interfaces between different media. Consider here three media, as shown, with a transducer embedded in medium 1, and radiating ultrasound towards the interface between the medium 1 and medium 2. At this interface, we may see partial reflection, and the magnitude of that reflection is given by the reflection coefficient, which is the difference of the two acoustic impedances over the sum of the two acoustic impedances. There may also be transmission, and the transmission coefficient is also shown. That transmitted wave will then propagate towards the interface between media 2 and 3, where again there will be some partial reflection and some transmission. And finally, when the wave encounters the rear surface of medium 3, it will also reflect. Note here that there is a reflection pulse associated with each of the interfaces as the signal propagates back towards the transducer where it is re-recorded. Note also that pulse 1 is phase inverted relative to the other two pulses. This is not uncommon, and if we look at the reflection coefficient equation, we can see that if Z2 is greater than Z1, the reflection coefficient is positive. However, if Z2 is less than Z1, the reflection coefficient is negative, in which case we get a pulse inversion, as can be seen in pulses 2 and 3. So now look at how we will start to build this into an image. The first thing that we need to do is form what is called an A-scan image. So consider here again the three media as we saw previously. And the three pulses. And this is what we call an RF waveform. If we now look at the magnitude of this waveform, so in other words, we wrap the negative going excursions into the positive going section of the graph, we end up with a rectified waveform. If we now consider the envelope that skirts around all of these rectified waveform shapes, we form this envelope, which expressed as a function of time and amplitude is the A scan or amplitude scan. We'll now look at how we transform that into something which is image related. So again, we'll take our A scan and we'll expand it a little for easier visualization. We'll apply a graticule and then we'll assign shades of gray to various points on that graticule so that values close to zero are very dark gray or black and values that are close to the maximum of the graticule are very light gray or white so that we can then grayscale transform our A scan trace into the image as shown. For each of the pulses, we can see that there is a bright white bar surrounded by predominantly dark gray or black areas. We also notice that as the amplitude of each of the peaks reduces, the brightness also reduces. Now let's look to build that into something that looks a little more like an image. This is what we call a B scan. So imagine now we have our A scan, which we can measure at a range of different locations. The measurement locations are shown by the blue dot. And here we can see a very simple A scan corresponding to the measurement location. If we move our measurement location laterally, we can see that we get a different A scan image from each location. And by aggregating these together, we form a B scan image. In this case, we can see that there is a curved shape on the left hand side of the image and some embedded object further in with a somewhat random shape. And here we remind ourselves that we're looking at distance against time plot into the material. 
It's important to realise that this image has only 14 lines, whereas if we're looking at a medical ultrasound scan, we could easily see greater than 128 lines. In fact, let's look at a medical B-scan image now. Here we're looking at something which doesn't have lines which are parallel to one another, as we saw in the previous example, but now because of a curvy linear transducer, the beam lines are sweeping out a sector. Unless one is very familiar with human anatomy, it may be a little difficult to work out what's going on in this image, so we'll add an overlay to help with comprehension. We can clearly see the characteristic shape of the kidney and some underlying tissues. We can also notice a darker region in the very middle of this image on the left, corresponding to an abscess. Because the abscess is primarily fluid filled, there's very little reflection from within, and therefore we have a very dark image. Contrast this with the rigid structures of the vertebral body at the bottom of the image. These give a very large reflection, a very bright white light, and that's why they're clearly shown on the image. We can also see the outline of the psoas muscle. We can also use these images to start to make measurements. Consider a simple case of a sample with water above it and a transducer emitting through the water into the sample. We get two reflected pulses, one of which is the front surface reflection, the second is the rear surface reflection. We can determine a time delay between these two reflections. And provided we know the wave speed, c, then we can relate a change in distance, delta x, to the delta time. We can use exactly the same principles to start to determine objects embedded within an item. This is very typically done within defect detection in non-destructive testing. So consider again a sample, with some water above it, and a transducer. This time we will introduce a defect in the middle of the sample. In the initial location of the transducer, we can see the front and rear surface reflections. But if we translate the transducer over the defect, we gain an additional reflection in the middle. As previously, we can use time delays to determine where within the sample, relative to the front and rear surface reflections, that defect can be located. However, if we wish to analyze a large sample in a number of different locations, we encounter a problem which we need to address carefully. Consider here, we're going to be making measurements at each of the crossing points as shown on the grid. As before, a blue dot represents our transducer position, and we will be scanning that through the grid to make sure that we can make a measurement at each location. Now for those locations where no defect is present, we clearly have our front and rear surface reflections, and when a defect is present, we have the additional reflection. But how do we go about identifying that? Particularly when we notice that the peak signal is the same for both traces. And if we were to look at the RMS signal amplitude, we find that whilst there's a little more energy in the with defect case, it's not sufficient to be noticeably different from the RMS signal when there is no defect. But we would nonetheless like to be able to clearly identify when a defect is present so that we can mark our sample accordingly. This is the feature that we would like to identify but we'd like to separate it from the remaining waveform. We can address this problem by applying gates to a waveform. Consider here the trace that we looked at previously. And we will allocate a region of this waveform as being the location where we would expect to find our front surface reflection. In fact, we allocate a region that's slightly wider than the front surface reflection pulse itself to account for the fact that there may be some drift of the front surface relative to the transducer face. We allocate a threshold to this, and any waveform within this gated area that triggers the threshold, as we can see 
by the top of the blue pulse being above the red line is marked as having triggered the gate. We also know what the minimum thickness of a plate is likely to be from a manufacturing tolerance, and therefore we can identify a region within which we are likely to find the rear surface reflection. We can allocate a gate for this too. Once again, we may have drift of the rear surface due to manufacturing tolerances, so the gate is wider than the pulse itself. And looking at the extreme ends of both the front surface and rear surface gate, we make sure that those are consistent with the manufacturing tolerances for the thickness of the plate. Now, if we're to try and allocate a gate associated with our defect that is too close to the front surface reflection, we may inadvertently trigger the defect of interest gate. So we can set a little bit of offset relative to the end of the front surface gate. This ensures that the front surface pulse has finished. And within this, we can set a, a gate for our defect of interest. You'll notice that the gate length is defined so that it's well after the front surface has finished, but before we encounter the rear surface pulse. And once again, because this is likely to be a much smaller signal than we would see for either front or rear surface reflections, the threshold level is lower again. In fact, if we use this, we can get very high resolution scans. And we can see here two UK coins of the realm that have been scanned using exactly this principle. In fact, here two gates were set, one corresponding to the front of the coin, the other to the rear of the coin. It's important to recall that we're now looking at an image which is plotting distance on both axes. And amplitude is expressed purely in terms of our grayscale. Throughout this tutorial, we've considered a number of different scan formats. So we'll recap those. If we have two distance and one time axes, and a volume of material that we're wishing to interrogate, we note that an A scan is at a single measurement location and expressed as a function of time. If we have an image which is formed with one distance and one time axis, this is a B scan with a corresponding B scan in the other plane. And if our image simply represents two distance axes, we have a C scan. So to recap then, changes in ultrasonic impedance underpin all ultrasound images. A scans are expressed as amplitude against time. B scans are amplitude against distance and time. And C scans are amplitude against two distances. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.